I've always found that the biggest reason why no one does this is because it takes a certain level of crazy and a certain level of consistency that many people don't have. And if you're crazy enough to keep on waking up every day to put something out there that no one cares about and eventually they could <laughs> care about, yeah. then you're good. Go for yeah. it. Make a brand. But if you're so hurt by the fact that someone's not going to care about your thing or that 10 other people are going to get way more shine than you because they figured out some cheat code or thing, you know, all good. I just think that many people are so afraid to fail, so afraid of what people are going to judge in them that they are so afraid to even put something out there that they created for someone to judge. This is Startup Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guest is Michael Sherman, founder of the clothing brand Market. Do you remember the trends that would ignite and spread like wildfire throughout your high school? You'd be walking down the halls and see everyone else wearing some new accessory, some new item. You had no idea where it came from. All you knew is that you had to be in on the fad. Well, Mike was the kid behind one of those high school fads. He created the shirt so popular that he got expelled for selling it on school grounds. If he wasn't voted most likely to succeed in his high school yearbook, it was a missed opportunity to predict the future. His career has taken him in many different directions, and it's a credit to his savvy and flexibility that he's been able to navigate the cutthroat world of fashion with such success. So listen in as we cover everything from how he ended up designing one-off jackets for the likes of LeBron and Kanye, what he's trying to personally solve for in creating a brand, and the inspiration behind creating a $30,000 Swarovski basketball. Now, back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Mike, founder of Market. Yes, sir. Thanks so much for joining. For people who don't know, tell everyone a little bit about what Market is. Yeah. So, you know, Market is a brand um, based out of here in Los Angeles. I started in November 2016. It originally started off at Complex Con, a flea market. I showed up with five t-shirts, five hats. One of the shirts was a shirt that said Frank Ocean with the Nike swoosh. At the time when he came out with that album that had the song Nikes on it, it was kind of an amalgamation of all these things that was happening in pop culture, smashing it together, you get something special. The next day after Complex Con, I put up a website called swooshfrankocean.com. It did $50,000 in sales the next day. And I woke up to my phone just like vibrating. And I was like, oh, it's all, the charger's broken. And no, it's like my Shopify just going crazy. So six hours later that day, after I was like, I'm moving out of my friend's second bedroom, I'm, you know, all this, I'm, I'm good, I'm gonna get a car. Cause I was like, <laughs> had just moved to LA after like a failed brand venture, living in my friend's second bedroom. I didn't really know what I was doing. And uh, when that all went down, I was just like, oh crap, I'm moving out, everything's all good. Six hours later, got the trademark infringement from Frank's team, had to give all the money back. Uh, but obviously, I, yeah, I knew why. Yeah. Um, and it was just a moment of me to, of reflection to be like, if I could just do this legally and take things in pop culture, smash them together, move quick at the speed of the internet, I could have something pretty special. So in reality, it was a more of a learning moment for me to be like, oh no, I just got to reapproach this differently. I cannot have this be something that, you know, I treat like my traditional fashion brand in the past where four seasons, classic trade shows, the whole thing. This was all built on the idea that I knew how to go from concept to final creation. And I didn't need anyone else to help me get there. I worked in a place called the Nike Bowery Stadium, which was, and I know I'm just riffing off into left field right now, but I got started in the whole industry by you know landing a job at the Nike Bowery Stadium, which was essentially a creator space in downtown New York that gave me and like 12 other kids access to an entire basement of machines to basically deconstruct jackets and make custom one-on-ones for their entertainment marketing business. You like know, Jeff and Hamilton. Maybe like Jeff Hamilton, but LeBron James comes in, sits down with us. We design him a jacket. Carmelo Anthony, Kanye West, back when he was with Nike, all those kind of things. I'd sit at a table with him, one other illustrator. We would design the jacket within five minutes, and I would basically then show you your jacket designed. Like You'd be like, I want a dragon ducking a basketball. And I would literally make you a dragon ducking a basketball on the back of a jacket within five minutes designed on my computer. I would show it to you, and then we'd spend the next two weeks downstairs making it. You know, and so that whole experience is what actually led me to where I am today because working there is what I afforded me the ability to buy some of the machines at a fraction of the cost because the agency running that Nike space was like, we have all these machines. We're going to go into storage. You guys want them? I bought a heat press and a vinyl cutter, and that's how I started my first brand, literally cutting reflective polka dots, putting them onto socks, making it so that I could keep myself safe while I was riding my bike at night. The reason I want to have you on is because my world was tech. Now it's real estate development. And I've always just been amazed at how brands are created. Mm -hmm. And to me, it just feels like so foreign. Like I have no idea how it goes. Next thing I know, I'm on your gram. 
and LeBron's got something you're wearing. Jay Balvin posted a video yep. with one of your shirts. Just dancing in a supermarket. Just dancing. Yeah. And it's like, you're not even tagged. The brand's not even tagged. And I'm just like, how does that happen? Yeah. You know? And it, and it's something that like I have no idea about. And I think our listeners are probably in the same boat. Not to give away all your secrets. But no, but it's the same mindset and thinking. Like, I would look at a building that has been distressed and disheveled, and I'd be like, how the hell is this going to become a real business? How is this going to become whatever you see it being? You know what I mean? And so I've always found that the biggest reason why no one does this is because it takes a certain level of crazy and a certain level of consistency that many people don't have. And if you're crazy enough to keep on waking up every day to put something out there that no one cares about and eventually they could care about, <laughs> yeah, then you're good. Go for yeah. it. Make a brand. But if you're so hurt by the fact that someone's not going to care about your thing or that 10 other people are going to get way more shine than you because they figured out some cheat code or thing, you know, all good. I just think that many people are so afraid to fail, so afraid of what people are going to judge in them that they are so afraid to even put something out there that they created for someone to judge because fashion is the most judgeable thing ever because it's something that you wear to represent yourself. When you think about yourself, do you think about yourself? Like so when you mention culture, basically you're like putting culture out there on your brands, on your clothing. When, when you, you say culture, I guess like, like we, there's a lot of broad definitions. Like when you were said like Frank Ocean and Nike as an example, like two things that were in, in mainstream culture, yeah. at the time. I've sat down with a lot of street artists. That's exactly how they view their, their art. Yeah. Do you view it the same way? It's like a commentary in a sense, you know? Like I think for me at first it was like, when we approach things like taking a Nike swoosh and putting it on to a Converse Chuck, you know, and then LeBron wore it before the NBA finals. And then literally I made a fake thing that I posted on my Instagram that said the NBA has fined, you know, the brand for essentially tampering with players. And if you really read the art, like the letter I posted on Instagram, it was all misspelled and disheveled and fake. But like no one knew. Heist and the Mighty posted it. Kids made a GoFundMe and they were trying to like support the brand out of this crazy moment like we were getting fined by the NBA. But it's all about the, wow. I like to say this a lot, the simulation of the streetwear brand. It's the idea that you can bring kids into our universe and make them feel like they're just a friend hanging out every day instead of it being this like bullshit thing of like, line up, buy a t-shirt, go online, cop the shirt, wear it, your friends know you're wearing Supreme, cool. Where's the actual engagement in that? Where are kids actually having a real community outside of maybe the kids who are reselling Supreme and making a business out of it? That's a community. I don't think the community really is rooted in like, skateboarding anymore or any of those things yeah you get to watch kids skateboard but supreme isn't giving you an, a platform for you to go also be a part of that they're not and so i recognize that now think about platforms like facebook instagram all that shit they've given you a place for you to be you and i'm trying to do that within clothing well i don't think you were the first person to ever have some spelling errors on the internet so, definitely not you know if people didn't get that they yeah. can be forgiven yes uh, for sure one one thing i wanted to ask you about though is when you were designing these jackets for lebron or uh, let's say like even going forward to j balvin dancing in a grocery store in your jacket is the idea to then have these superstars wear the apparel and turn that into a product line that you sell? Or is it just to create awareness of the brand as a whole and say, a, look what we're doing? It's a natural fluidity. You know, the idea that I can just go call LeBron and wear a shirt is doesn't exist. You know, it's special moments that come together within pop culture for those things to work. So for instance, with LeBron as a great example, we did our Crocs collaboration and we did our Grateful Dead. Um, and we fuse it together. I did a shoe. We did a whole apparel collection of these mountain climbing bears taken off the Grateful Dead thing. The whole shoe had the mountain climbing bears climbing all over the shoe. It was all tie dye. It was a perfect amalgamation of all the things that were popular within pop culture at that moment. And LeBron wanted it. He called his friend. His friend called me. I got the product to LeBron within 24 hours. LeBron ended up wearing it in the bubble, riding a bike, you know, and got shot by paparazzi just like, big dude on a little bike fucking riding, you know, that shit. And then, and then walking into the tunnel, like wearing it. Right. I couldn't pay for that. I couldn't pay for it. If I tried, I couldn't like convince someone to do it for me. He has to decide to do it. You know, how much do you spend on these designs? Like how much time do you spend? Is it a team? Do you guys sit down and yeah. go through certain things or is it as simple as like, it just comes to you and you riff? Grateful dead was a good example of that happened right in the beginning of the pandemic. I was locked in my house, like locked in, you know, I, basically hired this dude deadhead who was the authority of all things you know dead amphilia like you know i hired five of the top designers across the dead community that i thought were like the dudes who were putting out the best stuff within that world and then i ended up hiring one of the guys who you know worked with us on freelance and realized he could be great for the team but i think that that project was just an example of like 
perfect storm, holy trinity of everything. You know, if you told me that I can access bears, lightning bolts, skeletons, and this icon called steal your face, like all that kind of shit, it's like, it's a one in a million, you know? So the LeBron wearing it or any of those things happened from the one in the million moment happening, but it's kind of identified through like the creative process that you go through. And just, I guess, to rewind a little bit, like the Grateful Dead thing was probably three to four months of, of work in design. I'd say realistically though, two real weeks of design, uh, but I designed like 18 capsules for that because I was so hyped on Grateful Dead in general. I did Grateful Dead yoga, Grateful Dead basketball, like Grateful Dead van, like, you know, all this shit. We ended up buying a 1969 VW van, renovating it, new engine, wrapped the whole thing, you know, put it up on Donut Media and basically did like a whole thing with that. And I mean, there's just pockets of all these little universes to explore. And I think that a lot of times people just go surface level. You know what I mean? Like you can go get a Grateful Dead thing. You could slap their logo on a shirt and you could sell it. You'll sell a lot of them. Guarantee it. Just like if you did a Snoop Dogg collaboration, you put his face on a shirt, it'll sell. But if you actually went and invested a real amount of time and thought process into it, you might be able to come out with 10X. I feel like such a dad talking to you. I just feel like you're so <laughs> like, like my, my brain doesn't think like that, but it's so like awesome to, to see how it goes in your head. I'm like, a, yeah, especially like a when artist. I get coffee in my veins, like it's like, it just goes. And um, I love, I love how like committed your team is to the social media component. I mean, you have like people all over on social media, on yeah. TikTok, always doing cool stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is like constant, constant. Cause it's meant to be that you want to check on our Instagram because we're your friend, not because I'm going to sell you a cool t-shirt today. And why was that important to you? Why was that? Did you realize like on your journey that brands, it was the one thing brands weren't connecting with on a deep level. They were just like, here, look at this, pay us every to wear it, buy it. And then we're out. I only go check the brands that I like when I want to buy something, when they've advertised something that's interesting to me. And that's pretty much it. Not because I'm waking up and I'm like, I need a pair of really strong pants today. It's like, no, I know what I like and I know what I need. I think that it's just, it's missing the mark sometimes of like how we're marketing to consumers because kids these days, they go on Instagram not to just be marketed to themselves, right? Like they don't want a brand to just be pushing shit. We get enough targeted ads and things that we think series listening to us and whatever. You want to be able to log on and just be able to smile, right? You don't go into Instagram to sit there and be mindless and you end up coming off there depressed when you see a bunch of mindless transactional shit. And to me, that's what's missing in the entirety of all this stuff. And frankly, I think like part of this is giving sauce out to a lot of brands out there who just think that doing cool editorials and all that shit's what's going to sell your product. I think that's bullshit. I think that you, yes, cool editorials, all that stuff's great. But if it's not coupled with some kind of real connection to your consumer and why they care, you're missing the mark fully, you know? And it's like, but that kind of extends itself to probably any industry. Were there any brands that inspired you or, or like that, that you saw doing a good job of it that you wanted to emulate? It was more my friends. Yeah. Like I saw one of my friends, this guy, Scott Turner, he was just posting a bunch of like stories. Like it got to the point where it was like, you know, those little mini dots and like, you're just sitting there clicking through all this stuff and you get to look at memes and funny stuff and whatever. And that's where I started. I hired him to be like, yo, why don't you just like post all your memes here? And then, you know, I handed the phone to like four to six of the kids in my office and I said, do whatever you want. Go post your funniest memes. Go walk around the office and be like, yo, Diego, what, like, what, what are you doing today? What, what shoe do you like? What's your favorite brand? Just doing this stuff that you're like, what would you ask your friends? What would you do if you were just hanging out? And that got more reaction than the sexy $40,000 photo shoot I did for Converse or the you know, dope ass production of a cool video or like any of that stuff. And frankly, like it's disappointing sometimes because you're like, I put my heart and passion into this photo shoot, but it's sometimes about the more authentic, real and attainable things that make it possible, yeah. you know, and make someone feel like you're on their level, not that you're speaking down to them because that's what a lot of brands do. You know, you said that you, you had that moment of realization where if I can do this legally and, and, you know, move fast and break things as they say. So like, what was your first step in doing that? Like you were thinking like, Oh, I need to raise some capital or, or what? That was the last thing we did. I mean, okay. you know, this has been a bootstrap brand for a very long time. When I started this thing, it was just like, keep doubling down, keep doubling down. I ran an agency on the side of the brand that would pay for the brand. I did work for every record label. I helped many clothing brands develop their product, design it. You know, I have my friends' brands that I helped design for. It was just like whatever I could do. And I was doing a bunch of customization events for, you know, Nike, Adidas, like Reebok, all these people and traveling the world, just basically like making that dough, put it right back into the brand and just doubling down every time. I was paying just my rent to just live, but all the other money was in the company. 
you know? And so for me, it was just constant double down, double down. And I wasn't thinking about how I could do it for me. I was doing it for the team. I was giving these kids opportunities that they would not normally have. And I recognized the way I was treated inside of a workplace was always like, shut up, do your job, go to the corner, don't talk. Like, I'm your boss, I'm your OG. You do not need to give me your ideas. I will give you my ideas. And I think that that's utter bullshit because I'm not smarter than most of these kids. They just don't have as much experience as me, you know? And so I can articulate myself way better than a 25-year-old kid in my office who this is his first job. But I'll tell you right now, that kid understands my community better than I do. And I can admit that. A lot of my employees are fucking smart. And it's just because they don't know how to talk to an adult that sometimes they get shit on, you know? But I recognize that, like, you know, as we bring on more senior people into our company, COO, all that kind of stuff, it's recognizing, I tell each and one and every one of them, you're going to have to be comfortable with the 25-year-old walking into you and telling you that you're wrong, but that they cannot articulate it the right way. And you can't get hurt from your ego, you know, all this experience you have, all that shit, because that kid's probably more right than you are, yeah. you know? And it's like an interesting nuance that you don't find in most companies. And so I try to empower these kids. And like my first employee who was an intern is now one of the heads of marketing, you know? And like that kid is a boss now. Like he's stepped it up and like he's making a real salary. He's doing real things and like... I'm proud to say that he's grown from literally like just some kid who used to DM me graphics on Instagram. And like, you know, that was one of the first kids I handed the phone to and just said, go, don't, don't ask me, just go fail, make it wrong, do it right. Like you will get through it because I'd rather see failure to get to success than a bunch of fucking perfect shit because that's bullshit. It's totally true. It reminds me yeah. of like our team. Yeah. 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 Literally like they're hiring, like Lexi, our social media manager is like hiring people under her at the moment. And she's a rock star. I mean, yeah. she's so good. I think that's actually why I became an entrepreneur. I hated the whole boss thing. Yeah. It was like, wait, wait, I'm tied to your success. That doesn't make it. And you're going to take credit for all of it. I'm out. Like yeah. I was like instant. It was so black and white to me. That's why my employees should have equity. That's why they should be involved. Totally. That's why it's not just me in the highway. It's like, no, like even, you know, like when we had to change our name during this year, it was basically one of those moments where I sat with my team and I gave them the opportunity to tell me what they felt first before I just made a decision for the company before I decided where we went. How has that been received, the, the changing of the name so far? I think it's really positive because it's less about a rebrand and more about recognizing who we've always been. You know, we are the market of the internet. We are the market of the people. We give a platform to kids to be able to be safe in a safe space on the internet. It's a safe space as far as clothing brands go because this is a community that you can share and give and take, not just we give you and you receive. It's funny, like we run a Discord channel where kids can all engage. It's very much like old forum kind of vibe. And two kids from our Discord started dating. And like... We just ran a Discord design challenge. And like these kids are just like submitting the sickest designs I've seen. And so it's just cool to start realizing like you're creating a real community. You're creating a f place that's fostering these people who either A, dream to be working here, wish they have their own brand, or just are the avid consumer and give them an experience that they can all enjoy. Has anything changed for you like during COVID? So we, we had a couple brands on where as soon as like Facebook got super tight on some of their guidelines and basically canceled, like deleted their Facebook page. And they took all this time to build a real community with all of these people. Thank and God then, that didn't happen. And it happened and then they had to go recreate their own, but they weren't allowed on Facebook or Instagram anymore. And so some of these brands that we've spoken Sounds to have basically- like they did something bad. Or they just don't know someone good enough at Instagram. <laughs> yeah, from what we can tell, they not. Basically, yeah, that's for sure the, the case, but they also just created a second ad account. And so one of the ad accounts was getting blocked because it was like a Black Friday and they wouldn't allow them. It's a woman's product. So it's not anything, it's not CBD. It's not like anything that Facebook doesn't like. Yeah, but and it's the circumventing stuff that's what's, yeah. and that's and so fault. they got destroyed. They got canceled. That's why you need a smart that. data person who understands ads and not, yeah. Basically their person screwed them. But, yeah. it, but in this whole thing, it was like awful. Oh my God, I can't believe yeah. we just lost our whole community. And they created their own app. And on their app is different forums, different accountability chats. Like people started dating through their forum. It's bananas. And she was showing me and I was like, this is so amazing that, you know, that moment. And now they just text. Everything's text orders now. Yeah. And so basically that problem has created an opportunity for them. And yeah. And it's just all about you audible. That's anything in life. Right. Yeah. And I think that's like, even for us in this moment, it was about audibling in a smart way to make sure that not only are we getting a name that we're excited about, but leaving this name behind with respect and honor, because it's not about just like wiping your hands clean, but it's really about actually making sure you're connecting with the community and transitioning smart. Well, let's go back to, to the name change. So you were originally Chinatown Market, right? Yeah. And how long had you had that name for? 
November 2016. Okay, so initially, from what I've read, is that you were inspired by the, the markets in the Chinatown section of District of New York City, Specifically correct? the t-shirt shops on Canal Street, which are okay. very much like, you can buy fuck you fucking fuck shirts, I love New York, like it's like all the novelty, like bootleg, fun, like just t-shirts for lack of a better term. So is it fair to say that you liked the do whatever you want, like slap it on a t-shirt, like that, you know, that freedom. It's the rapid that, creativity. That you because, were trying to emulate yeah. and, and inspired by. Yeah. Uh, so like when when did you start seeing pushback on the name? When did that start to become an issue if you've had it since 2016? You know, I think that there there would sometimes be like conversations, but I think, you know, it it takes certain conversations to help open your eyes in a larger way because when I started the brand, it was like, oh yeah, I'm not creating something to hurt anyone. Like I'm doing this thing because it's inspired by t-shirt shops on Canal Street in New York. That's in Chinatown. And so, you know, you start to like build up this almost like framework, like, oh yeah, nothing I'm doing is wrong. But then as you start to have those conversations, which I think was started within the past year, was like close friends of mine, you know, people in the industry. And, you know, for every one of those kind of people, there was an opposite where I would have my friend who is Chinese call me and be like, fuck that, bro. You got to stay is what this is. Like, they don't fucking get it. And I'm like, that's nice, dude. But like, this isn't about me fighting some good fight over a name that I created out of in five minutes out of some like moment. It's recognizing that I got to listen to people who may not be my customer, may not even care or anything, but it's affecting them. And recognizing that first and foremost is key to this whole thing. Because I think like, you could easily ignore all of it and be like, screw it, we're fighting the good fight, protect the brand. But it was like, no, we had to listen to the community, make sure that we transitioned smart and left it behind with respect so that we didn't just tarnish the name of Chinatown. We tried to say, hey, no, we recognize that's not a name for us to own. Let's leave it behind with respect. Let's work with these different organizations to make sure that we're donating in that time. And through that transition, making sure that we're, yeah, as I said, doing it right. So sure, it was definitely a wild time and, you know, a huge question mark going through trying to figure out how to rebrand a, a clothing brand that's been established and all that kind of stuff. But I think landing on what market was, it recognized that we're not changing who we are. We're not abandoning the brand of where, where we came from. I think it's just all about continuing to solidify who we are. So as we double down on that stuff, it's just continuing to be who the brand's always been. And that's kind of the nice part is like by having market, we're not losing market out of our name. And you know, as well, I don't think people really realize like how much the craziness of getting a new name was. And that's not a pity or anything, but I think like people are like, why don't you guys have a new name yet? What's up? And we're like, yeah, actually it's because trademarks take a really long time or, you know, three times lawyers told us, sorry, it's not going to work. Yeah. You know? Well, in that vein, were there other names that you considered? Yeah. Fear, I mean, I won't share them because like yeah. I might, I might uh, yeah. still use them, but you know, <laughs> it's one that I will share is like my first clothing brand was originally called ice cold new york i then at that time was shut down by these guys who owned that owned the trademark for ice cold and clothing those guys never used it and ended up becoming an abandoned mark i literally have the word ice cold tattooed on my arm because that's what i thought the brand was going to be called and then i had to change the name to icny which then became this thing of like i see new york you know what i mean as visibility night riding like it was the greatest audible of my life so it's kind of funny and ironic that i've had to change my brand name twice each time, you know, my first brand, I changed the name because I originally was ice cold New York. That's why I launched it. The whole thing had to change the name this time, change the name. And I'm like, God damn, man, you know, like, but at the same time, that goddamn has nothing to do with like, you know, that experience. I think it just has to do with, yeah, man, like I just want to be creative and make products that people love. Like I'm never here to go create something that would offend people or hurt, you know, especially an underserved community like that. And it's like, you know, when you really took a step back, you had to recognize like Chinatowns were in a place where you chose to live. You were relegated to live there. That was somewhere where you were forced to live because you couldn't live there anywhere else. And some families did not have that choice. So in that experience, I had to recognize that. And, you know, that's through lots of conversations and making sure you're not just hearing the story you want to hear. I wanted to ask you, like, what are you solving for? Like, what are you personally solving for? As far as the clothing brand goes? No. As far as like you, Mike. It's just personal development, you know, like making sure that, sure, I could very easy, not very easily, because it took a lot of crazy work, but like build up a brand by myself and do it all myself. At one point I was shipping, designing, you know, doing everything. Um, I think as you continue to grow, it's just recognizing like you got to surround yourself with people who know more than you, people who can help answer those questions and set myself up for success by making sure that I admit that I don't know everything because you can very easily act like you do. I'm sure you've built the same thing in real estate, anything else, because there's a lot of nuance to every single thing that you go through. And 
I think for me, it's like admitting what I don't know and recognizing I need help or I'm in a situation where I don't know how to deal with that thing that just happened in my office or this employee did this to another one or whatever. And sometimes I had to call five people to be like, what would you do? And the more that I've gotten good at just talking to other people, communicating, setting myself up so that I have other advice and perspectives, it's helped me get through a lot of shit, you know, but as far as me right now, it's just continuing to take the next step as a quote unquote boss, you know, and walk the line of being a friend and a boss because you can't be both. But at the same time, like I'm not some drill sergeant and I'm not going to just whip people to death. I want them to feel motivated. I want them to come with me in lockstep and feel like they're motivated as what I'm doing is what they're doing, you know? And it's the same thing you said earlier of like, you know, the boss mentality, I'm doing this for that guy. It's like, you know, I want these kids to actually be vested into the future success of what this business is. And if I can do that and help them understand with that, then I've found success. For you, do you want to IPO or do you want to ultimately take this brand? I mean, man, like my whole thing since day one has been about shaking up the perception of what a clothing brand, especially a streetwear brand can be. Because I remember when I went into Urban Outfitters, my first like month of being in business because I knew them from my last business. And I remember seeing like tweets from different people in the industry being like, this brand's dead, it's over, like blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, actually the brand who did that is now gone. That doesn't exist anymore. And you know, all those people who say that, I'm like, you're the idiot because you're not recognizing that what I'm doing is I'm giving kids access to be able to experience my brand, something that you're not doing. And you're not realizing that by excluding them, they may not ever want to shop with you ever. How do you, you know? do that though? How do you, how do you do that? By giving kids access. By saying, so like, instead of it being this limited edition, one, you know, hundred products only on my site, you can go get it at Urban Outfitters. You can go get a version of my shit at Urban Outfitters okay. or Foot Locker or Nordstrom's, okay. you know, and that's Nordstrom's, Urban, Foot Locker, like all different types of tiers. Got it. You know? So you put and, it everywhere. But it's all different product. It's all a different experience. Foot Locker might be a totally different experience than Nordstrom's. And it's all that idea that those shoppers don't overlap. But I've also recognized very early that like, Sway Lee or, you know, bad example, like Scott Disick ended up wearing the brand or like these like random celebrities were getting the product, not from me sending it to them, by their stylish walking into Urban Outfitters. By, you know, because those people, that's where you go shop to go get the cool Gen Z, whatever. It's like all that stuff was ending up on people because it was sold at the store that many people shop at. And by giving myself a wider range, I was able to attract a wider range of audience. And I recognized through all of that, Sure, you can go really hyper specific. We could say like, I like making beaded bracelets and I'm going to go focus on the beaded bracelet market for girls from 16 to 24. But it was like, no, I want to make a unisex brand that's just about positivity, DIY, you know, kind of culture and this idea of like being super transparent with everything you, you fail and succeed on. And that is being human, you know? And so just trying to make a brand that felt like a friend. When you were working with these other brands, do you, was this really obvious to you? Was it so obvious that they were basically like straight down the middle? They believe this was their, like I can see this in tech where it's like, here's our audience, 25 to 34, 70% male. They make this much money. We're just going to keep going with them and we're going to join them on their life journey. Yeah. I mean, we even have to keep ourselves in line sometimes because like I'll get a sick idea to go make something crazy, but I'm like, this is not our business. You know, we need to focus a little bit. And like so, what? Like what's a crazy, like a bowling ball or something? Like, like Foot Locker Women's came to us and said, we want you guys to make a whole running tights and sports bras and uh -huh. you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. You should make tennis apparel though. Let's That'd be, be cool. Be <laughs> yeah. But like <laughs> realistically, me making project. a sports bra, it just doesn't make sense. You know, yeah, yeah. if I can make a shirt that everyone wants to wear, guy, girl, it doesn't matter. Great, you know, but my business is not about getting into sports tech apparel, you know, like I did that with my last brand and I know how hard it is to compete with like someone who's making a really nice garment. You know, I used to make running socks and people would send me emails complaining about how their feet were wet. I was like, do you not understand that shoes work by keeping moisture in? And so it's not just your sock, you know, you expect your sock to just re reject water. Like, so, you know, it's like a lot of nuance to the industry in general and just consumers being very non-educated but thinking they're very educated. Okay. Why do you think most brands miss this? the part of like how to connect with an audience more of like being everywhere more of a shotgun approach because everyone's so focused on the product everyone's so focused on how do you move more how do you sell more and by doing that no one's being creative in the process so you're saying they have the wrong target so for you the way you look at it is create something that's you spend a lot of most of your time on design creating an excellent product that fits we spend a lot of time on marketing we spend a lot of time on like what the experience is and like how can a you know a kid come into our ecosystem not feel forced to shop and just like come in and hang out. Come sit at this table with us and come talk. You can talk to us for a month. Then you might decide to buy. 
You might talk to us for six months and never buy from us, but you're still engaging. You're still pressing like, you're still seeing what's going on and you're telling your friends about it. And one of your friends might buy it, you know? And I'd rather that than to be one of those brands that's like, I need to get you every drop, you know, because that's a very focused consumer. And if you fail for them a few times, you've lost them. But for us, you don't care if our product isn't the best one for you because you realize one of the future drops might work for you and our content will be fun to watch. And what is the price point of all your... It's like from high to low, man. I made a $30,000 Swarovski basketball. We're... Really? Yeah, no joke. Sold a few of them. (laughs) Um, You know, hand encrusted. That's Uh, amazing. You know, so that's an example there. All the way down to like tchotchkes. You know what I mean? Keychains and stickers and all that. I made ping pong tables. I made basketballs. I've made bean bags. I made, you know, just anything. I made every sporting good you can think of with a smiley face on it. To me, the the ceiling for that is like Target, Dick Sporting Goods. Like, I don't think about my business as small. I think about my business as ubiquitous as possible because when I originally put out a smiley face on a t-shirt, I recognize this is the most universal icon in my life. It's something that was on, you know, this cabin that my grandparents built and we used to go into Colorado and like that is this big ass smiley face on it. And that's why I just started playing with a smiley face. I slapped the smiley face onto a basketball. Never been done before. You know, maybe it's been done sometime. But we were the ones that popularized the smiley basketball. I've sold probably just as many basketballs as I have t-shirts, which sounds crazy. Especially because you're a clothing company. And or especially because the yeah. brand name originally was Chinatown Market. You think a brand called Chinatown Market has the authority to sell sporting goods? Right. You know what I mean? Apparently they do. That's pretty amazing. Right. Exactly. And so to me, I get psyched because I'm like, smiley sports at Target, at Dick Sporting Goods. So that a 12-year-old kid who is living in a world of just do it, can go get something that says you can do it too. Not, it has to be the most intense. I got to be Ronaldo. I got to be, you know, Rafa. I got to be any of these guys. And it's like, why create that mentality for kids who probably never get there? I always wish that I could go to the NBA and dunk, but I never was going to. So I quickly realized when I was a, you know, sophomore in high school, probably want to start making t-shirts. My nickname in high school was Mikey Merchandise. I got expelled from high school. Mikey Merch? Literally Mikey Merch. for You know, I was selling t-shirts on the back of my car. I got expelled for selling and distributing on campus, a charge that someone would get for selling drugs. And I got expelled for selling t-shirts. My parents called the principal's office like, you're fucking crazy. You know what I mean? But Did they rescind the expulsion? I mean, no. They took an example out of them. But it was, I mean, that shirt I was selling used an image of a kid at my school that was like, it looked like his face was on a scanner. And I put it onto a shirt. The kid didn't get one. He fought someone in, in my school for the shirt. Like, and it basically like wanted one. Uh, I had him sign a photo release. It was like a whole moment in like, you know, my sophomore year of high school. Yeah. And uh, the shirt got banned. You know, it was like a whole thing. And I remember like I took like a photo in front of like the school gates, like holding it, being like, my shirt got, you know, it was like it's just that moment. And so that was like the first moment for me that identified I could probably do this for a career. You know, like people actually reacted to something that I created. Because yeah. I was like, you know, anything else I'd ever done, no one fucking cared. No one like, you know, sure, you do this, that, and the third when you're in high school, and like, you're just a fucking kid. You go to parties, you, you know, whatever. But that was the first time I felt real. I felt valid. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that your high school has not asked you to be their graduation speaker, but they should. Oh, they should for sure, but they yeah. will never realize it because I would probably, you know what I mean? Just like I think Parsons, who I went to Parsons School of Design for one year, this is not a generalized comment because there's definitely a lot of talented people in my class, but I'd say 99% of the people that I went to college with have shitty jobs. Don't fucking know how to get out of where they're at. Like they don't know how to even really excel in the industry. And while they were out partying, while I was at Parsons, my freshman year of college, like I was going to work. I was getting home at 1030 at night. I was hustling, trying to set myself up for success in the industry, not, how do I go to greenhouse or the next club in New York or whatever and like be cool? Cause I was just like, this is what I want to do for us. My life. I'm not going to college and having this opportunity for nothing. And like my parents, you know, I was fortunate enough. They said, we have enough to be able to help you out for one year. But if you want to go to college for four years, you're gonna have to pay for it. I ended up at the end of that year applying for scholarships. I didn't get any, you know, I applied to fit them cause I was like, fuck it. They didn't give me any scholarships. And in my head, I was like, I'm more talented than most of these motherfuckers. And not some like some egotistical way. It was because I wanted it more. I knew how bad I wanted it. I would do anything for it. You know, I got arrested trying to get a job for that dude, Jeff Staple in New York City, because I was either going to move home because my parents said you either move your ass home and you're going to live in the house or you can go to fit him. And I was like, 
fuck that. I'm staying in New York. I literally printed a bunch of posters at the Parsons Print Lab. I covered Jeff Staples' route from where he lived to where he worked. I figured out where his apartment was. I covered all those streets with those posters. I ended up getting arrested that night for graffiti, you know, repasting. And I was in holding for two nights, got out, and there was all these articles on like Hype Beast and all this shit about shameless self-promotion. I was just trying to get a job. You know, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I would do anything for it, you know? And so you kind of look back at that and that same fire energy and aggression towards getting what I wanted is being unafraid to fail. And, you know, many kids would just never do it because they think about the embarrassment of what it would come if they didn't get it. Did Fred ever reach out or anything like maybe not then, but after the fact, Jeff, uh, yeah, it's okay. Uh, so no, yeah. I mean, I had an interview with him. He sat me down and he was like, Mike, you're not just going to walk in here and get a job designing. Like, you're going to get coffee, sweep the floors. Like, and I was gutted, dude. I had just gotten out. I was just like, fuck. Like, I came dressed up. Like, you know, I had boat shoes on with some khakis. Like, I was all like, I'm getting a job. Uh, and I remember I came home and I, I didn't cry, but I was just like, I was so down. Like, dude, I just went to fucking holdings for this. Like, you didn't give me a job. And then fast forward four weeks later, I landed that job at Nike, you know, working in a basement with my dream of like all these machines and all these creative people who now work at Supreme and every other clothing brand that you know today. And like, you know, at that time I didn't realize what I was surrounded by. I didn't realize the people I was working with. I mean, I think in general, I think college, I mean, it just sets you up to be on the treadmill. Yeah. It's that's overrated. Really it. it's, it's a society. Unless a kid actually understands what he wants to get out of college, because right. I can guarantee 90% of people who went to college most didn't know where they were going. It's yeah. a continuation of the path that they were already on. But it also on. changes, like for you, even on, even like you doing all that work to get that job, only to be told no, or only for that job to reveal itself to you as something you don't want to do. So I went to business school, and I was like, I'm going to go to consulting after. And I I'm like, that's such a vague thing to think in, in college. So, like, so, I'm going to go into consulting. So I'm like, so what do you mean? Sometimes this is like so dumb. Yeah. but it's a good story. I love it though. Yeah. What ended up happening was I ended up this like I was in the application process, and I got intercepted. And this guy's like, let me chat with, let me chat with Diego. So we set up a chat and I'm like, oh, it's dope. My, my, you know, my thing got intercepted. I'm going to like, I'm talking to the team leader. I got it. You know? And so we do a zoom or it wasn't even zoom. It was go to meeting at that time. And he's like, yeah. So like real quick, I just want to jump on the, on the corner with you. Like I looked, I saw, I looked you up all this stuff. And he's like, You're, you'll never work here. And I just wanted to tell you that. And I was like, gutted like to Right. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you'll never work here. He's like, look, I know who exactly who you are. He's like, you're going to come in here, you're going to be on my team, and you're going to want to rewrite the rules, and you're going to want to do it a different way because you're going to tell us this way is broken, and, and that's who you are. He's like, I've, I've looked at everything you've ever done. That's what you do. He's like, you're a creator. He's like, go be an entrepreneur. Go make way more money than all of us, and you'll have a life, and you'll have time. So go do that. Never apply here again. I mean, at Thank first you. I would have said fuck you, but I think yeah, I would have said all Thank of you. me. All of me was like, do you feel like, like he like saw you. into your soul? 100%. Yeah. I felt naked. Do you right. know that guy now? Like, no. You should, like, you I, should, I, I know. Yeah. I know. I, I really yeah. like, I, I look back Because as much it. as I at first was like, what the fuck? I was like, man, man actually, maybe. Wait, he, he actually nailed you. Homeboy. <laughs> he he read a piece of paper he and he was like, I, I know everything about you. That's a pretty ballsy thing to say to someone that, you know, you don't know. But he didn't want to waste his time and he didn't want to waste my time and he was right. Because that's yeah. who I was at the time. Respect. I yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, for sure. And I mean, so, he brought you in there to waste your time. But, but aside those, from that. I think those moments, think those moments in you. life. Yeah. yeah. I'm just yeah. surprised why he even would take his time to do that. Yeah. Same. And at the end of it, he was like, you're going to make more money than us. And you're going to be more successful than all of us. And people will remember <laughs> you. kind of funny. And that, I was like, like. You would make that kind of prophecy. I was prophecy. like, I went from crying to like, uh, oh, yeah. And then I'm like, right. and then I asked the guy, guy like, why don't you do that? That, that's the question. Fucking idiot. Yeah, you got to go back. Like, but some people just don't have it. I'm like, yeah, I mean, but that, honestly, different. you know, everyone's solving for like, I think their own I talk about this it's all the easier time. to see other people's problems. It's either yours. defense or offense in life. And, and like, I'm just all offense all the time. And most people aren't like that. Not because they can't be. I just think it's because of what they've been told or, you know, the way society has impacted their ability. But the good news is all it takes is like a boss like you to like go, oh, this is, oh, what? Oh, he's listening. Oh, what? he's listening to me. And then they go tell their mom like, yo, can you believe Mike? Yeah. Like we're taking my idea. And now you've influenced that mom or that dad being like, wait, what? Oh, yeah, dude. No, I mean, like literally my warehouse kid can walk over to my design team, have an idea. It's online by the next morning and it's shipping out the next day, you know, and that's stuff that literally happened where one of my warehouse guys had a bunch of ideas. He's like, you know, posting on his own social, like I'm sewing, I'm doing all this shit, making all this stuff. And now he's in our atelier room. All he does is sew all day. You know, that kid is literally packing boxes. So it's that personification that like another one of my warehouse kids, he ran our whole warehouse, but he's like. I really want to sew. So I was like, cool, three days a week, you're going to sew. Let's see what you can do. Prove it to me. 
you know? Do you have any, any like dream collabs or any things that just shaking up the luxury world, okay. fucking up media, fucking up like, you what know, does that mean? What does that mean specifically to, to you? Like what does shaking up the luxury world mean? Does it mean like making it super cheap? Does it mean like, like in my, my head takes me to a different place than it takes you. Well, because I would world. think that the creating a Swarovski basketball is already <laughs> shaking up the luxury world in a sense. I guess. Yeah. But but, but it seems luxury. like there's more to I'll be honest, that, yeah. it's more yeah. doing what they do already. Anything. Like I'm just taking an object and I'm crystallizing it. Whereas like I'd want to go into a Prada or, you know, a luxury brand and go like shake up what they think they should be making for their fan base. You know what I mean? I want to shake up like how they even approach it, design perspective bringing this whole bootleg mentality of like deconstructing and reconstructing very DIY kind of approach will shake up these like very, you know, kind of institutional based brands. Same thing with like a Nike where it's just like, it will never happen, but it's just like when I took the Converse Chuck and I put a swoosh onto it at the end of the day, that needed to happen. That's pretty cool. Every kid wants it. That's like pretty dope. Right. And, but sometimes I think that it's recognizing that as much as we all dream, we're not going to be able to actualize those dreams for those brands, you know? And so a lot of times what I've lived my life doing is ask for forgiveness, not asking for permission because the only reason why I collaborated with Converse, at least in my opinion, is because I got their attention. We first bootlegged the Converse, put a swoosh onto it. They're in like flight club for a thousand dollars. Now we don't sell them. We don't do anything with them, but those things became an enigma and a collectible. And it's all about playing on those tropes and being able to like give kids something that they could never get. And I think that that's the unfortunate thing with these antiquated brands sometimes is just like they have an amazing sauce that they hold on to, but they're not able to unleash it because they're guarding this like property. Do you have a whole team that deals with them though? Like with I these mean, brands that are team, trying to But come also you got to think you? about like my design team has to go through like 15 revisions, right? So it's like, yeah, I could hire a guy for it, but that's a, you know, it's like a full-time thing. Well, what little I know about the high fashion world, I do know that all of the top brands are constantly searching for the, the newest and best designer coming up to shake things up. I, I read about it all the time and uh, it, it's kind of like how Tom Ford made a name for himself. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you think Jacobs, about it, Mark Jacobs. Yeah. Uh, sure. There's a long history of people uh, who have signed on to big labels and, shaking things up so to speak but to me and to be honest i'm not an insider at all but to me an outsider <laughs> yeah at all to You're me an insider outsider to something. that's all that matters it, yeah it, it doesn't seem like any of these designers are ever successful at shaking the the limbs of the tree do you feel like uh, and and i could be totally wrong on this but do you feel like that it's because these brands are too big to have the tree shaken like that yeah i think that you know I give credit to guys like Virgil, you know, over at Louis Vuitton and, you know, he's pushed it. He's been able to do it for every person who hates on that guy. You're not recognizing that this man has been able to do things that no other designer at a luxury house has been able to break through, you know, and I respect that. Just like that's why I get Is excited Kanye about in that camp too. Um, I mean, just cause he hasn't worked at a luxury house and gotten shaken up a brand. Yes, he did it with Adidas, but I also argue that like Adidas literally just said, go make a brand and we'll pay for it. You know, and like, we'll get some cool marketing tail out of that. I think about it less than maybe. I mean, yes, that's probably the biggest example of it. Maybe I'm fucking wrong. Is like to say, yes, Kanye was handed the keys and it was just a go. Yeah. Like I have friends who work for that, that whole camp. And like, literally Kanye would be like, I want a factory in Wyoming. And they'll be like, cool, factory in Wyoming will be on a boat from Germany happening. In, and it'll be there by next week and we're going to build it. And then he'll have it built and he'll be like, I want it two miles away. And they'll go move it two miles away. There at one point where, and this is a maybe top secret, who knows? That I'm not on any NDA with Adidas, so who cares? But they were literally like going to build factories on planes for them to fly with wherever Kanye was going. You can think about how expensive that is uh, and the cost of just scaling that. But those were like the ways that they were thinking, right? And like, that's pretty crazy. That's crazy. But, but it says that's how much need. he was able to go fuck up the brand and help them think differently because... A, he gets to push the needle for them, do good business, big sales. That's great. I think that it just helps people to think about the brand way differently. And so you associate easy with Adidas and then you immediately bring more value back to the Adidas brand. And by letting him go fuck it up, you now like Adidas that much more. We're in the process of maybe doing a television show where it's uh, multiple seasons. Every season is effectively a different story. And so season one is all about tracing like the seed of coffee and how it ends up in your cup. 
and yeah. all kind of like those like involved. Netflix shows that like how it's how it's uh, or explained or things whatever. like yeah. kind of yeah. I, I hate that but it's almost it's like, okay I don't mean to yeah, I don't, yeah. it's an easy human thing to do where I find the thing that's closest to whatever it's you're like saying, chef's yeah. table meets yeah. like planet earth but anyway another yeah. season of this is like slash how I built this yeah kind of yeah. another season of it is I'm like, like um, okay, I'm keeping fighting things like I know. stop talking yeah <laughs> <laughs> in the television show an idea of season two would almost be like fashion and so instead of a seed being a literal seed it's like all these designers sitting here and how they eventually decided to put fake on all gucci's new line but tracing the whole thing so now they got the leathers the dyes the thing and then all the way to like it being an aspen and somebody spending whatever they're spending on it and just that full circle is that as interesting in real life as it is in my head? Because in my um, head, that's interesting. Like that, those decisions being made. It's just hard are to let crazy. you. It's hard to have it be authentic, right? When everyone's sitting there with a bunch of cameras on them from the beginning concept part, that is very hard to capture authentically. Because it could be me literally driving down the road, and I'm like, "Diego, we gotta do this right now, bro. Yo, this is crazy. I got this fucking idea." And then you guys gotta go recreate that on some fucking, okay. you know, film. It's hard to do. Black okay. and white with, you know, yeah. Non-union but I, actors, but, at the, but, at the same but time, they are meetings, right? right. Are, no, okay. but like it's right. possible. But like you go watch the show, like the hype on HBO, you're gonna kind of be like, this is kind of fucking stupid. Like, why is Quavo or fucking what Offset or whatever the authority of fashion? And like, sure, he's a rapper who wears clothes, but like, does he understand how clothes are made? Does he have you know real taste in making clothes? Any of those things? Hey, maybe he does. So you know, sorry, Offset, if I'm shitting on you. At the end of the day, I think that it's just like it's an interesting setup and how do you document it properly so that it doesn't feel so performative you know what i mean like anything because it's like yeah it's nice to sit, say make a big idea but like those big ideas don't just happen by putting people into a room you know it happens from like a special person like you having an idea else. to build this and then you guys all call each other and you're like we're building it yeah. not because you guys sat in a tv show and like made it so that's the hardest part I find. I mean, that's good to know. There's more of the journey than, than just. It's the journey, right? Because yeah. Yeah, you can go talk about the, like that can be more of a talking head saying like, you know, this is the journey in the beginning. You know, they did this. These people have been working we on this do, concept. We can do market for one of the episodes. Yeah, it's just episodes. for sure. I mean, trust me, we're building our own like reality show as it is right now. Are you? Yeah. So, that's awesome. Because it's like every time someone comes to my office, it's like walking into the fantasy factory. So you're literally like, you know, like everyone's like, there's not a TV show of this. And I'm like, but how do you fucking document all this yeah it's a like lot I'm running chaos happening at all times i'm running around the office like i got an idea do you have let's bodyguards? do this <laughs> no i mean god knows yeah definitely not but oh yeah sorry i was like bodyguards i was like oh big black big black yeah. um but <laughs> no man it's just yeah it's like do you skateboard I, around um I'm trying to visualize i it. wish i mean it's just i'm a, I'm a runner i yeah. just like i all of a sudden get an idea and I, I run to like the area where someone is well, before we wrap, anything you're working on right now that people can expect this winter, this fall? Do you even follow the guidelines of seasons when it comes to what you're doing? There's no guidelines. We could have an idea tomorrow. You know, if something happens in pop culture, I'm going to react to it. I mean, frankly, like, it's, it's just about keeping the creativity fluid and just having fun with it. If I'm not having fun, then I'm not going to do it. You know, and I think at the end of the day... I'm just always trying to make sure that this place is a personification of what I originally wanted to build, but on a way higher level. And I think that I'm just always striving to find that balance and happiness in my life, which is very not there. You know, at the end of the day, it's this constant churn and what makes you happy five years ago doesn't make you happy today. And so I'm always trying to make sure that I don't get lost in this like what's next thing. Because maybe it's not that I'm just not happy right now, but I think that I have always lived my life from the ship is always sinking to motivate myself to go that much harder, to tell myself to be in the gym shooting when everyone else is partying or all that dumb metaphor. And I think that I'm just making sure through all of that, that I never lose sight of my life and personal mental health. Because I think I spent a lot of years sacrificing everything for my dream, you know? And I think that many kids out there, I've definitely been a part of it, of encouraging just mindless hard work, but I recognize it's all about balance, you know? Like, you see it now more than ever within sports, culture, entertainment, all those kind of things, and it's just like, I recognize that I could go through the same thing if I keep going down the path that I'm on, you know? And the pressures that come with building a bigger business, the pressures of hitting goals, the pressures of people liking the shit you create, you know, anything like that, talking to people, therapy in your life like being communicative when things are hard I think is the thing that I had to learn a few years ago that I never had therapy in my life I was like I'm busy I'm fine like this is cool 
It's like, no, you start losing your mind. You get stressed more than you've ever been. And I think I just, you know, for me, it's about making sure that I'm always continuing to talk, call people, advisors, friends, therapists, et cetera, because this is a message for kids everywhere because it's like we all think we're mentally strong and can handle all the problems, but you can't. And I guarantee your parents probably didn't fully equip you to handle them either. We all got our own pitfalls, things we miss, things our parents taught us without realizing it that are our disadvantages, and we have to continue to audible with that to make sure we can stay around for many years being creative and having fun. Yeah, that's super smart. I've, you know, when I was in tech, I was solving for money. And so I was like, but forgetting like, yourself, literally. Yeah. I mean, didn't go to the doctor, didn't go to dentist, yeah, didn't, which is didn't see I family, well. didn't yeah. go to like weddings. Yeah. And I did that for like four years. I missed my mom's on. birthday last year. You know what I mean? Like it's to that point where like, I think actually, no, it was this year and it was in the middle of the name change. My mom's birthday was August 18th. We announced the name August 16th. Or no, sorry, August 10th, and then we August August 16th, we announced. I was so busy, so all over the place, I fully forgot. I couldn't believe I forgot my mom's birthday. You know what I mean? And it was like moments like that where I was like, oh, shit. Where like, I don't, I forgot to call my brother on his birthday, you know? And he thought, that, like, he, luckily he was in the mountains somewhere, and he's like, oh, you must have tried to call me. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, you know? So That's why I was asking what you're solving for. Yeah, I'm trying to solve for balance, yeah. you know? And Every time you level up, it's very easy to lose some part of your life that is just there to make you happy because you're sacrificing that for the thing you really want, which is success. Mm -hmm. But for me, success isn't money. Success is being able to do the thing that I want to every single day. Success is finding that happiness. And like, I also recognize I worked at Jamba Juice in a taco shop in high school. I never want to do that again. Mm -hmm. That's why I wake up every day working as hard as I can because I want to make t-shirts for the rest of my life. You know, I want to be creative for the rest of my life. I don't want to put myself in a box and you know or not put myself in a box i just want to like don't want to lose sight of why i got into this in the first place it's the love of the game I just love doing it well and, in that you know? creative aspect when you ever get in a creative rut is there a technique or something that you do to kind of recenter yourself and and kind of take I had a, a step back moment last night where i'm like working on a collaboration for my chemical romance which is like totally crazy one for us because it's a totally you know new universe for some of our fans and Etc. And I was having a hard time because at first I'm just feeling like I'm designing a bunch of merch for My Chemical Romance and it's not that exciting. And, you know, Grateful Dead's one thing because as I said before, it's lightning bolts, bears, and skeletons. It's easy. But like with My Chemical Romance, I had to really think like, how am I going to make this iconic? How am I going to push this to the further thing? And I was sitting there for hours smoking weed, just relaxing, trying to think about it, sitting at my desk. My hips are killing me because my fucking body's falling apart. <laughs> I'm like sitting there and I'm like, I just need to get up. And so I took the dog for a walk came back, sat down, and it just came to me. You know what I mean? But it doesn't happen every time, you know? I didn't get the luxury to, I haven't had the luxury in the past two, three weeks to sit down and do emails during the day. I'm going to get home and I'm going to have like 350, 400 emails I'm going to have to sift through, try to respond to, then mentally be on top of all the projects we have coming out. But I love it, you know what I mean? And also we're in a plain time where like we're scaling, we're trying right, to right. add people to the team. The so I won't have to do that. this forever. Right, right. But yeah, it's exhausting, you know? Yeah, it's hard. And I think like my team works just as hard as I do, you know? And so I think I'm always also trying to be conscious of that and make it easier for them, you know? So while I'm going through shit, I'm trying to make sure they're good. I'm trying to make sure everyone's good, you know? And I think that's always the biggest stress that people don't recognize about running your own business is like, mm -hmm. it's easy to think about the little shit, the day-to-day -day -day bullshit. Oh, you're, all, yeah. yeah, the spot's dirty or whatever. It's like, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Right. You know what I mean? All of it's on your back. Yeah, for sure. So love it thanks cool. for coming on man no, guys thank you big time where can we find you everyone can find you absolutely yeah. guys so yeah. Instagram. you want to you want to <laughs> find us guys it's just at market on instagram obviously market market market.com i think it literally is like market social guy on twitter because uh, we like to play this whole fun idea of like this persona who runs our twitter and on tiktok i think it's just market 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 so yeah you know guys i think all around appreciate you guys having me on here i think yeah. for any you know kid out there it's just don't be afraid to fail but, pleasure chatting today yeah thank you guys